the law to really figure out and, and see it thoroughly. But uh, we had all kinds of uh, lighting on those lighting effects, and it shows up more or less. Okay, now maybe we'll shut this off up here, and we can put the, the light back on there. Yeah? Um, it's just a okay. I'm giving you the. Uh, we we'll talk about it a little bit. Okay. Thanks. How many of you could see it in the back? Could you? Could you tell the neon lights were good? Okay. Now let's talk about the significance of what you just saw. We just saw a five millimeter thread of water under normal tap pressure, approximately 30 PSI, deliver slightly under 10,000 volts. Now this, we've run this experiment in various cities across the United States, as Walter said, and the apparatus can give us a measure of the bioelectric content of water. It can also test water's quality. Now there's a direct relationship between the electrical content of water and water's state of health. And there's a direct relationship between the state of health of water and the state of health of every bioorganism that utilizes the water. So the cities that we have tested have ranged from San Francisco, California, which only showed about 5,000 volts, and they would barely light the neon bulbs, to uh, Oahu, Hawaii, where we measured about 12,000 volts. And of course the brilliance in the tubes would correspond with the lower or higher potential. Now the cities, the difference in the voltage is a direct reflection of how the water has been treated physically and chemically. San Francisco's water is pumped centrifugally over a long distance, sometimes in open channels, and it's heavily treated with chemicals for purification. And Oahu's water was from a local artesian well. However, it was treated with chemicals also. And if we compare those voltages with the voltage that you can measure from a mountain spring, we find that the mountain spring can deliver up to 60,000 volts. That's quite a difference. There's other differences also. There's a difference in the gaseous content, in the mineral content, in the temperature of the water, and in the density. And all of these factors reflect back on water's capability of holding that electrical potential. Now if we ran distilled water through this wasser Fodden apparatus, we would have no electricity delivered. The neon bulbs will not light because distilled water has been stripped of its mineral and chemical content. Hopefully that's what distillation is for and depending upon how good your unit is. And so therefore it cannot make an electrolytic solution. But distilled water can be recharged with electrical content by a vacuum synthesis process, which we'll talk about in just a minute. A question often asked about this experiment is, why does the water break into the distinctly layered field? So all bodies of water whether they are still or moving, come in laminar layers, strata. And each of these layers has a different potential, a different density, and a slightly different temperature. And each of the layers has a boundary between it. It has an indifferent zone, a neutral zone. And that zone serves the function as a cell membrane or our skin for it both insulates 
the potential differences between the layers and it regulates the exchange or the conduction that happens between the layers. And the outside layers <coughs> of either the, on the surface of a still body of water or those next to the pipe or the channel of a moving body of water have a lower electrical potential, a higher temperature, and they're less dense. They're constantly being discharged through friction. And as we approach the central layers of water, we will find that they have a higher potential, they have a lower temperature, which approaches the optimum temperature of a plus four degrees Celsius, and they are much denser. And depending upon what conditions the water is subjected to, that electrical potential can be contained in the water, it can be held, it can be recycled and recharged, stepped up to a very high potential. Now in the Wasserfaden experiment, we are discharging the potential for the sake of showing that there is a bioelectric content in water. We're subjecting the water to all of the negative or detrimental conditions so that it cannot contain its electrical content. We're subjecting it to centrifugal pumping, diffusion under pressure, oxidation, temperature rise, and molecular disintegration. We are splitting apart the laminar layers so that it will release its capacitance. Now this water, if it's consumed after running through the Wasserfaden experiment, has very little life energy to deliver to a biosystem. <clears throat> and the detrimental conditions that are in the Wasserfaden experiment are exemplary of those that are found in our conventional water treatment systems. And in addition, the water treatment systems of most municipalities add chemicals, poisonous chemicals, to treat and kill bacterial action, which is only a reflection of the poor state of health of the water in the first place. So unfortunately today, most people are drinking and bathing in either poisoned or dead water. We're feeding it to our plants, our animals, and our families. And don't think I'm just talking about a few isolated cases because there have been um, surveys done in all of the U.S. states and their territories and compiled showing that there are 2,100 contaminants in our drinking water supply since 1974. Now the EPA has regulations on very few of these. Most of them have never been studied for their long-term harmful effects. And in the early 1900s, Victor Schauberger began warning us of the consequences of improper water treatment. He predicted the decline in our agricultural productivity, the loss of our rivers and streams, the loss of our vegetation, our forests and our animal species, and the rise in cancer and genetic deficiencies. He said they would occur parallel with, pardon me, parallel with our misunderstanding of the nature of water and our mistreatment of it. Now he not only presented the doomsday predictions, he gave us a very extensive insight into the character of water. And he engineered and constructed devices which could maintain and uplift the quality of water while at the same time drawing electrical potential and mechanical power from the water. And he showed us such an abundance that had never been accomplished before. He taught that we should look at nature and copy the centripetal motion of cycloidal movement. Now one such device that Schauberger copy nature's process of making spring water is this unit on this side of the table called the vortex water spring. Um, we have duplicated that unit and it 
duplicates the process that occurs in the geosphere where water is enriched and made potent before it levitates itself as a spring. Schauberger called this mature water, ennobled water. It's highly charged with bioelectricity and it's ready for consumption. Basically, the process consists of special mineral catalyst and carbon dioxide gas being linked molecularly to the water in a hermetically sealed egg-shaped container through a vacuum synthesis process. A vortex runs in the urn for approximately 20 minutes and a 10-inch um, vacuum of mercury occurs and the whole process is done at four degrees Celsius. This unit makes approximately one gallon of water in 20 minutes and it makes water comparable to that of a high altitude mountain spring. Uh, we now manufacture these devices and we have a video available which shows the process and if you're interested please contact us afterwards. Now let's go back to the Wasserfaden experiment. What else did it show us? That the electrical potential in a very minute stream of water can be drawn off inductively and utilized. That tiny thread of water at a relatively slow velocity delivered so much electricity. And while it was being subjected to the detrimental conditions now, Schauberger built machines and proved that water will indeed deliver elect electrical potential and mechanical power, which could be amplified beyond man's imagination and current techn technological knowledge, and without destroying the quality of the water. That means without electrolysis, without steam, without molecular disintegration, without taking it apart and burning its parts as fuels. Quite the contrary. The water would be uplifted, ennobled, enriched. He produced a new form of water, which he called poly water. It is different from um, heavy water. As a matter of fact, he called it light water because it produced his levitating effects. He taught in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s that yes, indeed, water is the new fuel of the future. And he also gave us a non-destructive method to pursue this new technology. Now, our, our, our current research at Energy Unlimited is duplicating the works of Schauberger and teaching vortexian mechanics. And we would invite you, if you are interested in either the vortex water spring or vortexian mechanics, to uh, contact Walter or I during the conference, and we have an information packet available. Um, thank you. That's it for today. And we're going to entertain questions after they turn the tape off. Okay?